really in the whole Bible. Um, it's real common for people to point to a verse of Scripture and because something occurs in the Bible, then try to pull that into their life and their exper experience today. I call it the snatch and grab um, method of, of preaching and teaching. There's very little thought, especially when the, in the uh, concept of the signs and the wonders, you're thinking about that subject and that topic, very little thought given to why those were present even in the first place. And we see them abundantly in the New Testament. We see them in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. We see them in the Old Testament with men such as Elijah and, uh, and others. <coughs> so why are they present today in the dispensation of grace? Do they continue today in the dispensation of grace? Um, the point I want to start with is um, there in the middle of the page, why the spiritual gifts, we're going to start there kind of in the middle and, and jump around a little bit. Um, Acts chapter number 26, the Apostle Paul, in his ministry with the dispensation of grace in the Gentile churches, during the book of Acts, which is when we see these things demonstrated and operating, during the, that, that about uh, 20 to 25 years of Paul's ministry and life, we see those things operating. Actually, it's a little longer than that. It's about 30 years. Um, and the reason first and foremost, is because Paul is receiving his installments, uh, in, in receiving the message of grace in a series of revelations. And maybe I should back up just for a second. There are two categories of gifts. One category is the men. There are special men classified as apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers. The men, the actual men were gifts. We'll look at a couple of verses about that. Then there's the category is the, is the manifestations, the demonstrations, the speaking in tongues, the healing, um, other types of miracles and signs and wonders that were there. Right from the start, in Acts chapter number 26, we have Paul's testimony. He gives his testimony three times in the book of Acts. Well, he gives his testimony twice. His conversion is recorded three times. Notice what we have here in, in Acts chapter 26, verse 16. As the Lord appears to Saul on the road to Damascus, verse 16, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen. Well, at this point, he hasn't seen much as far as time goes, but what's the one thing that he has seen at this point in time right there on the road to Damascus. What does he see? He sees the Lord Jesus. He sees the resurrected Lord Jesus. The tomb is empty. It's, it's still been empty for, for, for quite some time. So Paul is going to be a, a witness of the resurrected Jesus Christ, just like the 12 apostles were. I've appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. See, right from the start, Paul is told that he is going to receive further encounters and revelations with the Lord Jesus. Paul, as he is given this new message and this new program, he is, all, he is not giving it, given it in one lump sum. He's given it progressively. We talk about progressive revelation. That's an important term in the Bible. The Bible itself is progressively revealed, isn't it? Adam had some information. Abraham and well, Noah and then Abraham had more information than Adam did. And then you get to Moses. Moses had more information and so on. You have to consider kind of like the old Watergate question. Who knew what when? And who knew and when did they know it kind of a thing. And that's important to consider as you think about, uh, about the Scripture. So Paul has a series of revelations. I'll show it to you again. Go over to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, which was written probably about Acts chapter 20. Because you can trace through the, through the book of Acts... As Paul is going and traveling from place to place, 
You can compare information within the individual books and kind of tell when those books were written. Act, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, he says this, It is ex not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. When he writes 2 Corinthians in Acts chapter number 20, he says there's more I'm going to receive even from this point. And he's been ministering for quite some time. There's still more. It's an amazing thing. Paul received his informa information in a series of encounters with the Lord. Look at, um, you're right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse number 7. He receives a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, uh, lest I should be exalted of be above measure. Not just one or two or three or four. He says he has an, he's had an abundance of appearances by Jesus Christ. Many, many things that he, that he saw. Um, while we're right here in this passage, just drop down a little bit further. I want to look at, just catch a verse while we're here. Um, Look at verse number 12, well, verse 11, chapter 12 and verse 11 and 12. I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing I come behind, or I am behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds." So this tells us something about the, the signs, the, the miracles and wonders. The signs of what? An apostle. The, the, the miraculous demonstrations validated a man and his ministry. It proved that he was something special. Just like today, I, he says the signs of an apostle. Uh, there was some time back, Kurt knows, maybe knows who I'm talking about. We uh, met a fella in Alliance and attended some of his Bible studies. And there was another man that attended there who claimed to be an apostle. He was kind of off the wall a bit, kind of a, a unique. But he, he said, I'm an apostle and I'm a prophet. And, you know, I wasn't going to be um, antagonistic in somebody else's ministry. Um, you know, different man Bible studies, this fellow was attending there. But I could have said and should have said, well... How do you know you're an apostle? How do I know you're an apostle? Show me a sign. They say signs are for those that believe not. So I don't believe. <laughs> Show me a sign and then I'll believe. See, there are people that they, that they claim to be apostles and prophets and have, have supernatural abilities. One of the ways you validated that was through the miraculous demonstration. So there are, um, he's, he says, the signs of an apostle. There were two categories of gifts. You're right here in the book of 1 Corinthians, go to, or 2 Corinthians, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verses 28, 29, and 30, and 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. Notice what he says here, verse 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, governments, diversities of tongues. Notice the order. What does he list first? The men. The men are the primary and the more important more important gifts. Um, first, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings. Helps. Governments. Diversities of tongues. That phrase, governments. Do you think that's uh, so a guy could be a politician? No, not really. Um, hold your hand here and come back to the book of Romans with me. Romans chapter 12. We'll come back to this passage, but go to Romans chapter 12 just for a minute. Romans chapter number 12. 
Romans chapter number 12. Another passage in one of Paul's Acts epistles. The book of Romans was written during the book of Acts. Romans chapter number 12, verse 6. Romans chapter number 12, verse 6. Having then gifts, differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Was teaching a gift? Having a special ability to teach? Um, I don't know if I have that gift or not. <laughs> well, I put it this way. I know I don't have that, have that gift. When these gifts functioned and operated, they did so in an... It, it, there's a verse in the book of James that says, Every good and perfect gift comes from above. When God gives a gift, are there any flaws and defects in it? When God does something, you wouldn't think so. When these gifts operated and functioned, they operated perfectly. With, with perfect and complete knowledge and understanding, these men had a supernatural ability to teach and to minister. Uh, the gift of teaching, he talks about there. Um, you say, well, what are you doing then today? Teaching today is, is not a gift. It's an acquired skill. You might have some... There's a difference between a talent and a skill, uh, a natural skill. Now, I use the example Michael Jordan, probably the most fa famous basketball player that ever lived. Did he have some natural abilities, some natural God-given abilities to run and to jump and, you know, the, the physique and, you know, his ability, the, the, the mindset and the heart and all those things? And yet... You have natural abilities, but he just didn't just walk on the basketball court and say, give me the ball, did he? You know that Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team? He did not make, it might have been as a freshman. And that so motivated him. You know what he did? He went to work. And the, the, dip, the thing that set Michael Jordan apart, and we're not going to talk about Michael Jordan so much, was his work ethic and his heart. And he took the natural abilities that he had and honed them and practiced. You ever hear of muscle memory? You know why people shoot 100 free throws? So that your, your body just begins to do the same thing over and over and over again. Same thing why, why golfers, they practice their swing again and again and again. And when their swing gets out of whack, then they try to change it. It's hard to change your swing because your body wants to do the same thing over and over and over again the same way. There are, there are natural ways that your body works. There's a difference between a spiritual gift given by the Lord, a supernatural ability to do something in a, in a certain time and in a certain way, and a talent that you have to develop. People talk about, oh, so-and-so is a gifted musician. Very few of them. I mean, you know, prodigies and so on, they can sit down and, and play by ear and that kind of thing. But it takes years to hone a skill. And, uh, and to develop an, an ability there. Um, he says in verse 7, or ministry, let us wait on min our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching. Verse 8, he that or exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. See that he that ruleth there, the ruleth is the same thing as governments over in 1 Corinthians. That would be oversight in the assembly. Leadership. Didn't, the, didn't these local churches need people to, didn't they need elders and deacons and so on to um, administer the fair, uh, affairs and, and care for the things and so on? That was part of a, of a spiritual gift that was given. Go back to 1 Corinthians. The government's there, not politicians, but they're the ability to rule and, and exercise oversight and manage in the assembly. He says, um, Continuing on in verse number 28, diversities of tongues. So there's the first thing that's listed are the men. The next thing that, that are listed are the, he says, after that, miracles and gifts and healings and helps and so on. Those are secondary, aren't they? He says in verse number 29, notice the questions that he asks here. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? 
You, you read that, you don't see the answer to the question, but what's the implied answer to that question? No. Is everybody an apostle? Well, no. Is everybody a prophet? No. Are all teachers, are, do all have, are all workers of miracles? No. It's interesting you drop down to verse number 30. He says, have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues? What would be the answer to that question too? No. And yet you have people today that try to encourage everybody in the assembly to do what? To speak in tongues. See, the, the gifts were spread around and not everybody had the same ability because there was diversity within the body of Christ. My point here, though, is, is, to, is to say this, that the first category of gifts are the men. Then you have the signs and wonders and the, and the special ability. The men themselves were a gift. Now, he says there in verse 28, God has set some in the church first, apostles, plural. Now, when you think of apostles in the Bible, you, you know, in our assembly, the first guy you think about, hopefully, is Paul, right? But then who do you think about when you think about the apostles? You think of the 12, don't you? And you read that verse, and sometimes folks think that, well, the 12 apostles were part of the body of Christ. They were part of, part of this ministry. That's part of who's Paul talk, talking about here. But yet, what have we learned in seven hours and you know, through the years? Is, are the 12 apostles part of the grace program? They're different, aren't they? There were apostles, there were men that, that were, were called apostles in a secondary sense. If you're here in 1 Corinthians, go to, uh, go to chapter number 4 for a moment. And you'll see as we, as we develop this a little bit that the gifts, the, the men, were an absolute necessity. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, and then I'll tell you where, where else to get. Go, go to the, we'll get the book of Acts chapter 14 as well. We're going to get a couple of passages here. But we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, let's see, let's start in verse 6. He's talking about the uh, ministers of Christ. Let, in verse 1, he says, Let a man so account of us as ministers and stewards of the mysteries of God. Um, verse 6, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. One of the problems at Corinth was that they had, they had hero worship, didn't they? They, 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 oh, I like Peter, and I like Paul, and I like Apollos, and I like, they, they, and they were, they were, one of the ways they were divided, they were divided over celebrities, and we've got to be real careful that we don't put men up on a pedestal. He says, I don't want you to think of men, uh, think of us even, he says, above that which is written. Then you drop down to verse uh, 9. He says, for I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were, appointed unto death. Now, who is he talking about in the passage? He and Apollos, right? Apollos was also an apostle. Maybe I should say this. What, what is the definition of an apostle? What is an apostle? Somebody who was sent, right? They're sent with, with divine authority to speak for the Lord. It's kind of like, it's not a prophet. A prophet was a spokesman on a that, that just that, that ministered kind of in a local area, but an apostle traveled from place to place. We know Apollos here was, he's called an apostle. Look at the book of Acts. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Um, here's Paul ministering in Lystra, and he heals a lame man. In verses, uh, it says he was crippled from his mother's womb in verse 8 and 9 and 10. Look at verse 11. When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, their, their voices saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likes of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice unto them. They're going to start worship, worshiping the men, right? These guys are, some, are somebody special. Look at verse 14, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. 
So there's another apostle. Who else was an apostle? Barnabas. Okay? Now, apostles, but in a secondary sense. Paul says over and over again, we looked at the verse, he says, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. There was something special. Paul was the head apostle. He was the one to whom God gave the revelation. But there were other men that were sent that ministered as apostles in a secondary sense. I'll show you one more place. Go over to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, another Acts epistle, a book that was written during the time that Paul is traveling throughout the book of Acts and from one place to another. Um, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians um, chapter number 2, verse number 1. He begins to talk about the beginning of his ministry. He's, he's telling the Thessalonians to look back when he first came. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God. He's not just talking about himself, is he? If you go back to verse 1, it, the very first verse of the book he writes and he says, Paul and Silvanus, which is Silas. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of Thessalonians. He's talking about the three of them as a unit. He says, when we came, we, we, uh, our entrance was not in vain. Look back at chapter number 2. Chapter number 2, verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles, plural, of Christ. So this would include not just Paul, but also Silas and Timothy, right? My point is, is that there were, it's not the, when you see apostles, don't automatically think it's the 12 and that the 12 are included in the church, the body of Christ. The 12 were apostles to the nation of Israel. He says, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. They had a different program and a different ministry. But there were men associated with the body of Christ and their ministry and the things that they were, the things that they were doing. Um, one more passage. Go to the book of Ephesians. Go to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4. Ephesians, chapter number 4. Um, verse, um, let's see. Let's start with verse 9. Ephesians, chapter 4, and verse 9. He says, Now that he that ascended, what is it but that he first, or but that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Who's he talking about there? Jesus Christ, right? He ascended up, sat at the Father's right hand. Notice in verse number 11, he's seated at the Father's right hand, okay? And he gave some apostles, plural, and some prophets, plural, and some evangelists, plural, and some pastors and teachers. Notice the different categories of the men there. The, the men themselves were spiritual gifts to the body of Christ. Notice when they were given. This is not when the Lord was on earth walking the streets of, of Galilee and, uh, and Jerusalem before his crucifixion. When does he give these gifts? Later, doesn't he? After he's ascended up, when he begins the new program, he starts with who? He starts with Paul and saves him on the road to Damascus and says, Paul, I'm going to give you a series of revelations, personal encounters with Jesus Christ. And he give the, give, notice verse 11 there. Notice the tense of the verse. It doesn't say, and he is giving some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and pastors and teachers. What's the tense of that word? He gave. Paul is writing the book of Ephesians. You know when the book of Ephesians was written? Much later. 
It was one of his prison epistles. It was written after the book of Acts had closed. And Paul is now a prisoner in Rome. He's been to Jerusalem, and he's been taken captive, and he's had his voyage to Rome and the shipwreck and all that stuff that happened, and now he's a prisoner in Rome. Remember we talked about the difference? That the books of Romans and Corinthians and Galatians were written during his Acts ministry when he's traveling, and then the books of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians were written later, okay? So here Paul is looking back at the point in time when the, when the age of grace began, he says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. What was the purpose of the gifts? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Were those gifts themselves, were they permanent? No. He says he gave the gifts for a specific purpose to edify the body of Christ till something happens. Now, verse number 13 there does not say till we're all unified and we all believe the same thing and we all understand it and we're all just, you know, Happy campers living, living and functioning together. That's not, that's not what he's saying. That has never been the case. Sometimes people think that these gifts were given, and that's talking about heaven. You know, when we get to heaven, we're all, you know, so these gifts are going to be in existence until we get to heaven kind of a thing. Because that's when we're all going to be unified. That's where we're all going to understand. But that's, that's not what he's saying here. He gave them for the, for the for perfecting of the saints till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. And remember, what did that ver word perfect mean? It doesn't mean sinless. It means what? Full grown and mature. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. He says, now we see through a glass what? darkly. These gifts were an absolute necessity in the early days of the age of grace because they did not have the written word of God as yet. Paul's epistles are not even written when we're reading in Corinthians about he set some in the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Do you know that, that those churches operated for almost 20 years before the very first letter was written. It's either the book of Galatians or the book of 1 Thessalonians. We, we're not really sure, but those were probably the two first epistles that Paul actually penned down on Scripture. Well, how are those local churches going to function and going to operate? How are they going to have church if they don't have a Bible? <laughs> and you got churches, you got churches in, in Syria, you got churches in Galatia. You got churches in Asia. You got churches in Macedonia and Achaia. You got churches in Greece. You got churches in Rome scattered all over that area there. How are they going to have church? How are they going to gather for edifying and, and ministry if they don't have a Bible to study? Answer, there were men given that had information imparted to them in a supernatural way, and they could stand up and they could teach with authority because they spoke for God. An apostle, we just looked at some of them, Barnabas and Apollos and Timothy and Silas and those men. You know what, what those men have in common? Those men traveled from place to place. Paul would send Apollos to Corinth, and he sent Timothy to, to Philippi, and he sent Timothy to Thessalonica, and he sent Timothy to Corinth. Those men would travel around. If there was a problem in the churches, Paul could send some of these men to that local church to oversee and to rectify problems that had arisen and to comfort and encourage the saints there. So there were, the apostles were men that traveled from place to place. A prophet, the, the, the prophet was a man that, could, that, again, spoke with supernatural ability, 
but he was a local guy. He would be a guy that would be there that could actually speak with, with divine authority locally in that individual local church. Um, a teacher. By the way, a, a teacher. Does a teacher originate? Does he go and, I mean, I, I realize sometimes the professors, they'll, they will write a thesis and they'll try to develop new thought. But generally, does a teacher teach new information? No. A teacher communicates things already known, don't they? So you, you see how these, how these men would work together. You had men that would travel from place to place to place to oversee, to, uh, to, to rectify problems, to come in and, and fix a situation or to advise or to counsel. Then you had local guys that were there that, that had information imparted to them that could carry on the ministry on a weekly, regular basis. You had teachers that would, that would communicate information that was already known effectively. Um, you had pastors. One of the men, a pastor was a shepherd, had, had ability to, to care and counsel and, and nurture. We use that term today. I'm the pastor of Berean Bible Church, but those pastors did a lot of things. They would teach, and so it was, a, it was an over, overseer. My point is, is that these men were an absolute necessity early on. Let me show you something. You're here in Ephesians. Let me show you a, com a comparison. Look at Ephesians chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse 2 through um, 5. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. He says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by what? Revelation. Revelation. He made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. What is revelation? Revelation is a personal appearance. Jesus Christ appeared to the Apostle Paul personally. He saw him on the road to Damascus and he was going to appear again and again and again. He says the abundance of the revelations. Okay? How did Paul get his message? By direct revelation. Okay, notice what the passage goes on to say. He says in verse 4, whereby when ye read, what do you read? You read the scripture, okay? So now, they, now they've got some of these books written. Whereby when you read, you understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, by revelation? No, by what? By spirit. See the difference? Paul got his information how? Direct encounters with the Lord. How did these other men, the apostles and prophets, how did they get the information? The Spirit would reveal it to them personally in a, in a, in a miraculous way, but still not the same, is it? So you see, if Paul is out traveling around, and he's ministering and he's going and establishing all these different churches, Paul is getting his message how? In a series of personal encounters with the Lord. So he, gets, he, he travels from one place to another to another. He's in place number three, and the Lord gives him some more information. Let's say he's in Macedonia. How do the people back in Galatia how do they keep up to speed with the new information that Paul just received? Okay? Paul receives it how? By direct revelation. The Spirit would communicate that information in a spiritual way, indirectly, not, not directly from the Lord, but through the Spirit of God in a, in a secondary way to those local guys in those different churches. That's how everybody could keep up to speed. You follow? See how, that would, see how that would work? And so that's how these churches are, they, they, he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. So, so all of those churches could gather and, and learn and grow at the same rate. But who's the head guy? Paul's the head guy, right? Who's the one that is actually writing the books down? 
Paul is, okay? So you see how, see how this is working. Um, w- w- one other thing, let's go to, um, let's go to the book of, uh, let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Remember we talked about Paul going up to Jerusalem to communicate his message to the, to the, to the Jerusalem church there? We'll study this as we're going through the book of Acts. But Paul went up to Jerusalem, and this is about, this is, he says in Galatians, 17 years. Think about it. Anybody in, the, in here 17 years old? Probably the closest would be Kyle and Hannah, you know. About, about their, their, in their mid-20s, okay, so they're a little older than teenagers. But 17 years is a long time. Paul got saved, and he has to go up to Jerusalem and do what? Communicate the new message and program to Peter and James and John and those leaders there, okay? What was the thing that they, the main thing they were discussing? Wasn't it circumcision? He says, um, Acts chapter 15, verse 1, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and these are the brethren in 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 Paul's churches, and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Was circumcision a big deal in Israel's program? Sure was, wasn't it? It was was the sign of the everlasting covenant. And Paul's got these Gentile churches out there, and he's establishing them in the grace message. What's Paul telling the Galatian churches? If you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing, right? Were those Gentile churches supposed to practice circumcision? They weren't, were they? But some people had come from Jerusalem and says, hey, circumcision's a big deal. You guys got to be circumcised. Paul says, no, no, I got a new message. You see the rift there? See the two programs? And they're, 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 there's friction? So what does Paul do? He goes up to Jerusalem to communicate the message, verse number 4. Well, verse 3, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church of the apostles and elders. Now, who are those apostles and elders? Those are, those are the 12, although one of them's missing because James has been killed. Okay? In, in chapter 12 of Acts, James has been beheaded. There's only 11 apostles left. Okay, but this is the Jerusalem church and declared what things God had wrought, had done with them. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. There's the rub. See, you've got two groups here. You got the Jerusalem church that came from Pentecost and all those believers that are under the kingdom program and still under the law of Moses. And you got Paul and the Gentiles out, out there and his Gentile ministry were not under the law, were under grace. See the difference? So they're going to have this conference. Okay? And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. Verse 7. And when there had been, what's he say? <laughs> Much disputing. This is a hot topic. (laughs) Okay? Circumcision and the law of Moses and all that. And so they're arguing back and forth. Peter stands up and he talks about Cornelius and, hey, I went to the Gentiles. Um, Then he says in verse 12, look at verse 12, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul declaring what? The miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. See, see the, the argument here is basically between two competing authorities, isn't it? You got the 12 apostles and the Old Testament and the law. And circumcision is necessary and the law is necessary and that program was in effect. But then you got Paul and his Gentile ministry, and what's he saying? Circumcision is nothing. 
and if you be circumcised, Christ has profits you nothing, and we're not under the law, we're under grace. See the conflict, the, the conflict there? What settles the issue? See, see, up until this point, the people are saying, Paul, you're not right. Look at this. this. Look at what the law says. You're not right, Paul. What does Paul, he declares... He doesn't continue the argument. What's he, he pulls the trump card. What does he say? The miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And you know what? That settles the issue, doesn't it? And after they had held their peace, James answered, and James talks for a little bit here, and they agree that Paul has a legitimate message and ministry. What proved, what settled the issue with that Jerusalem church that Paul was actually an apostle? The signs and wonders and miracles. So you got a new program. You got a new apostle. He's out among the Gentiles. The signs and wonders validated Paul and his ministry among the Gentiles there. And while he's carrying out the ministry... You've also got other men, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, teaching these, these churches about the grace message. Go to 1 Corinthians. We need to wrap this up. We, look, we went through this passage. We went through this passage uh, last night. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The men were necessary because the word of God was not written. And God was revealing the message progressively to Paul. And those other local churches would be kept up to speed. There are signs and wonders taking place that are proving not just that Paul was a legitimate apostle, but that the converts were legitimate converts to the new program. These signs and wonders were signs to Israel of a new program and a new ministry. Notice he says, he talks about the greatness of charity. Um, verse 8, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Are those supernatural manifestations, are they going to ever, are they going to cease? Clearly. Notice what he says. He says in verse 9, why? They're going, why are they going to cease, Paul? For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Those spiritual gifts were part of a program where the glass wasn't full yet. They're associated with partial knowledge and progressive revelation and communicating information to the people. And why are we prophesying? Why are we speaking in tongues? A word of knowledge. The Spirit of God, he says, to, to one by the Spirit is given a word of knowledge. To another is given the word of wisdom. You know, when there's a debate, there's an argument, or people need help, you go to your pastor, don't you? Or you go to the Bible. God, give me some help. Give me some knowledge. Give me some understanding. They couldn't go to the Bible. <laughs> the Bible wasn't there yet. So he says, he says, these things are associated with partial knowledge. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is complete is come, then that which is in part shall be what? Done away. Well, when that which is complete or that which is perfect or that which is mature is come, if you're going to complete something, the only thing you could complete would be something that was incomplete before, right? What was incomplete before? Knowledge. You follow? We know in part and we prophesy in part. That's why he talks about when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. When I became a man, I put my toys away, hopefully. Now we still got men who play video games and stuff, right? <laughs> okay. These gifts were associated, they were a necessity in the early days of the program 
to get the, the to, to edify the saints, to carry on the ministry, but they were also signs to the Jewish people of a new program. Paul is out there among the Gentiles. We didn't look at it, but there's a verse in Acts chapter 18. You know this church in Corinth was right next door to a Jewish synagogue. A bunch of Jews next door seeing all these miracles and all these wonders and all these signs. And you know what that's, you know what that's proven? That those guys are really, God's in their midst. What happened to Israel's program? Israel's program has, has stopped functioning. So if these, and by the way, those people in that Jewish synagogue, they were, they were apostates. They're not saved people. They're people separated, you know, because where is, where is God working with the Jewish people? In Jerusalem. Isn't that where God is dealing in the Jewish program? So when Paul is, is, goes into those Jewish, he's going into these, origi these religious establishments preaching the gospel of the grace of God and working miracles to try to get those. He's proselytizing. <laughs> you know what proselytize? You know, try to take somebody from one church to another. Okay? He's trying to bring these Jews into this Gentile church. He's trying to get these people saved. You follow? Israel's program, by the way, that Jewish synagogue, that whole program has been put on hold, hasn't it? the law of Moses and all those other things. He says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The thing that is perfect is, that comes is the full knowledge when Paul stops getting the appearances of Jesus Christ and he's got the whole message. And you know what he, what he does then? In 2 Timothy, we'll go there, let's go there and quit. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know the verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy is the very last book that Paul wrote. He's getting ready to die. Isn't he? he tells Timothy, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. He's getting ready to check out. When, when Paul writes 2 Timothy and puts his pen down, the Bible is complete. We've got all the books. We've got the full revelation. We've got all the information we need for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect. Partially furnished? No. Throughly furnished. Unto some good works? Unto what? All good works. We don't need an apostle any longer, do we? We got, we got God's word right here. We don't have to go to a man. We go to the scriptures. And something else that's interesting, you know what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15? He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, right? We quote that verse all the time. Do you know that that's something they can do now that they couldn't do before? You know why they couldn't study? Because they didn't have the scripture. <laughs> they did they? The Bible hadn't been written yet. So they didn't have to go study for a message. The Spirit gave it to them. And they would come with a supernatural ability. He'd be recognized in the assembly. He'd stand, a guy would stand up and preach, or an apostle would come in, or a prophet would stand up and prophesy, and they'd know that that's God's man because he's got the signs and the wonders and the credentials. They didn't have to study to show themselves approved. They didn't have, all they had was the Old Testament. Right? You follow? But now when, when Paul writes 2 Timothy, you know what those people have to do? They have to do the same thing I do. Have to get up at the crack of dawn, crack the book, get a cup of coffee and a sweet roll, and you have to get your nose in the book and do what? Study! <laughs> To show yourself and study to preach. It might not look like I prepare to study, but I do. <laughs> you know, but those guys didn't have to do it. They had supernatural abilities to teach and to communicate. And they did so, and everything they said was right because it was the Spirit of God speaking. Is everything I say absolutely right? 
better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so what are you going to do? You're going to hold my feet to the fire with what? With the book. Check it out. You know, search the scriptures, whether those things are so. Because this is the authority. I'm not the authority. Okay? What's the authority? God's word. See, those things functioned for a reason. And the signs and wonders confirmed the word, just like they confirmed the Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God, just like they confirmed the word that Elijah was an apostle, just like they confirmed Moses. What did Moses say? They're not going to believe me. <laughs> right? So what did God say? What's in your hand? A laser pointer. No. <laughs> a rod. <laughs> you know, and he threw it down and it became what? And it convinced him. Yeah, God, I guess God really did appear to you, Moses. So anyway, the signs and the wonders aren't operating today. I said all that to say because we have a book that's the final authority. And the perfect has come and that which is in part has been done away. Okay? Got all that? Okay. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for the completed word of God and our Savior of whom it testifies. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.